All right. Um, so there's so much focus on voting by mail, um, uh, and and you know at times even worry about the capacity of the post office that uh, perhaps we haven't paid sufficient attention to in-person voting in a pandemic. Um, and as one political scientist put it, in some of our minds, the nightmare scenario isn't about voting by mail. It's a meltdown at the polling places. So are we ready for in-person voting during this pandemic? And what has your team done about the concerns that we've been hearing, either about COVID contagion or long voting lines or about voter intimidation? So in Michigan, we do have options to vote this year. And of course, you can vote early by mail. You can vote in person early at your local clerk's office uh, between now uh, and election the day before election day. And then you can vote at the precincts at your local precinct on election day itself. And one of the benefits of now this being the fourth election that we've run this year in the midst of a pandemic is that we've been able to in each one uh, really um, improve upon and perfect uh, the in-person voting option to ensure everyone's health, safety, and security. Uh, number one, all election workers have PPE, masks, gloves, and sneeze guards, and polling places are set up with social distancing guidelines intact uh, to ensure that no one's uh, health is at risk uh, and that our CDC guidelines are followed in every precinct. Uh, and that is not unique to Michigan. I know Frank's doing the same thing in Ohio. Uh, Paul Payne, Iowa, and in fact, Anheuser-Busch has just delivered gallons of hand sanitizer to every Secretary of State today uh, to help with that. So we've got the sanitation and, and, and health of our precincts intact. Uh, the second thing, and the reason why I mentioned all of those options, uh, is because you know we're on track to have more citizens vote in Michigan's election this November than ever before in any election in our state's history. By the way, Frank, we're going to win our bet. Uh, and, we'll get to uh, that in a minute. And, uh, and so, but, but because of that, the question is, well, how do you run a remarkably high turnout election in the midst of a pandemic? Well, you do that by spreading the vote. And you know, of course, everyone knows their options. They can choose the one that's best for them. But when we have record numbers of people voting absentee in Michigan, record numbers of people voting early, we're expecting about a third of turnout will be in, pre in person at your local precinct at, on election day. That means, and again, we've tested this already over our three elections this year, uh, minimal crowding, minimal lines, if any at all. In fact, we have not had any lines at precincts this year because we've been able to ensure people can take advantage of all these other options as well and only vote in person on election day if that's the option they choose. And about a third of the voters typically choose that, although notably in our May elections, only 1% of voters chose to vote in person on election day. So we're ready. Again, we've built the infrastructure for that. And finally, the third question you mentioned was about safety uh, and protecting the safety of our election workers. Now, I'm fortunate enough to have a really tremendous attorney general here in Michigan, uh, and we're working. We're basically joined at the hip for the next week and, and weeks ahead uh, as we work to develop safety protocols and working with local law enforcement as well. Uh, we have to strike a number of balances there. We have to ensure transparency of our precincts and polling places because we want people to have faith in the process and be able to observe as poll watchers always have, but observe from a designated spot in the precinct, not uh, removed from and not talking to voters, uh, wearing masks and also you know, abiding by the health protocols we've put in place. And on top of that, uh, drawing a very uh, direct line between observation and disruption. And if anyone crosses that line and becomes disruptive, uh, they will be held accountable and removed. And you know we can go into more details, but that's the basic essence of it. And no voter should fear their health or safety if they do choose to vote in person on election day in Michigan. A couple of things on this. We've been really working to encourage absentee and early voting specifically to help uh, make sure that we don't have lines or crowding on election day. And so that was a clear objective from the beginning. That's why we're so excited to see the record-breaking numbers that we have of, of absentee votes right now. We, we sent out uh, this envelope just a couple weeks ago, which is an absentee ballot request form to every registered voter in the state. And I've been really happy to see uh, a large and enthusiastic turnout this week. In fact, I'm predicting that we're going to break the record for early voting in, for, in the first week of voting 
this week as well. And in some cases, we have seen lines on the first day and second day of early voting. But really, uh, that's not because there need to be. It's because there's enthusiasm. People have 27 other days that they could go and do early voting, but people are enthusiastic to get out and vote. So first of all, we're really happy to see high numbers of absentee and, and early votes. And again, what that helps facilitate is to make sure that we can have that smooth experience on Election Day. In Ohio, we operate close to 4,000 polling locations. They have to be staffed by 37,000 Election Day volunteers. And so one of our main thrusts has been recruiting not only those 37,000 that it takes to open the polls, but an additional number. We've actually been aiming for 55,000 poll workers, and we just went over 50,000. So we're going to get there. Uh, and that makes sure that we have that reserve force trained and ready to go in case we need to call them in uh, on, uh, on Tuesday, November 3rd, in case there are folks that don't come to work, for example. As it relates to the health scenario, we've been very clear, and I've been very clear, if you feel comfortable going to the grocery store, you should feel comfortable coming to your polling location. And that's because we've instituted a 61-point checklist. And maybe this is my military background, but I'm a big fan of checklists. I like to take a complex set of tasks and put it into a sort of well-organized checklist. And this 61-point checklist, which you can find on our website, VoteOhio.gov, was developed with the CDC and with the Ohio Department of Health and in coordination with our local elections officials all throughout the state. And what it lays out are the standards that we have to protect public safety. And it's the things that you would expect. It's masks. It's, it's shields. It's having one door in and a different door out. It's maintaining social distancing by separating the machines by at least six feet. It's wiping down commonly touched surfaces. It's all of those things, but also making sure that we've surged the supplies to our boards of elections that they need. That started with the $12 million in federal CARES Act money that we got, which I pushed out the door, almost the entirety of that money out to our local elections officials so that they could use it to hire extra staff, buy extra mail handling equipment, and also purchase personal protective equipment. But as Secretary Benson mentioned, we've also seen a lot of great patriotic companies that have stepped up with donations. We had a mask manufacturer here in Ohio that donated close to a half million masks. And just like in Michigan and Ohio, we've had Anheuser-Busch donate 3,000 gallons of hand sanitizer, as well as many other folks that are donating supplies like that. And so as far as the health scenario at our polling locations, we're going to be ready here in Ohio to make sure that it is a healthy environment for both poll workers and elections officials. Finally, on the security environment, just like Michigan does, Ohio allows credentialed elections observers. Those are individuals that are in Ohio nominated by their party or by their candidate. They are credentialed. They're not allowed to carry firearms. They're not allowed to wear uniforms or any other kind of paraphernalia that identifies a particular party or candidate. And they're very strictly governed in Ohio as far as what they're allowed to do. They're basically allowed to be a fly on the wall and to observe the things that are going on in that polling location. If they see something they don't like, they can step out and call the Board of Elections. They can bring it to the attention of the person in charge of the polling location, or they can call the legal counsel for their campaign or party. But under no circumstances can they interfere with the voting process or with the poll workers and the work they're doing. Additionally, in Ohio, we establish a 100-foot boundary around each polling location, which is a buffer zone. No campaigning can be conducted within that 100-foot boundary. Of course, the First Amendment is in full effect just outside of that. People can wave signs and pass out flyers and, and express support for their favorite candidate. But what they're not allowed to do in any capacity is intimidate voters or obstruct voters or impede voters. And the law is very clear on this in Ohio. That's why I had a, a conference call this week with the sheriffs, the county sheriffs all throughout the state of Ohio. And I sent them a memo clearly laying out our expectations uh, for what local law enforcement will be doing to enforce the law in Ohio. There will be no tolerance for intimidation or any kind of impeding of the elections process by anybody uh, outside of a polling location or inside for that matter.